coming up on Double Tap TV. We dive into Windows accessibility, what are the most useful features, and how on earth do you turn them on? Plus, how does Apple stack up when it comes to accessibility on a desktop? The latest tech. In second place, with a total of five points. Interviews. Look, uh, the most useful product we can at lowest possible price. Accessibility. I'm loving it, and I'm sticking with it. This is Double Tap TV. Welcome to another edition of Double Tap. My name is Mark Aflalo with Stephen Scott. If you want to get in touch with us, so many ways to do that, Stephen. We'll start with feedback at ami.ca. On Twitter, it is at Double Tap Canada. And use that hashtag, Ask Double Tap, and we'll get to those questions a lot quicker. And we'll get to those questions towards the end of this show. A great show lined up for you guys. Stephen, I think that uh, you and I are both in this interesting, similar situation where we are shopping for new computers. It's not really yeah. fun, is it? <laughs> no, I mean, you, you think it's a lot of fun, don't you? And, and it does feel like a lot of fun until you actually start delving into so many options. I mean, you know, so many different customizations. It's quite difficult to pick one out, isn't it? It, it is. You know, I, I've been using a Mac for about probably about five years now. I switched to the MacBook Pro when a couple of those specialty softwares that I were using finally came out with a Mac version because there was a time, believe it or not, that there were only Windows versions of certain software, but finally mm. they came out with Mac versions and we went to it. And, and I found that when I made the switch, Windows just wasn't as reliable as Mac was. It was just more prone to viruses. Things would build up over time, but you know what? Over that period of time, we've seen the introduction of solid state drives. We've seen the introduction of, of much faster RAM and much faster memory, which overall really do make the case for a PC that much more appealing. Now, correct me if I'm wrong here, most of the low vision community tend to aim towards the PC world, the Windows world, correct? Yeah, you would think, considering how accessible iPhones are, and we've talked a lot about that on this program, you would think that people would gravitate towards Macs. But that's not true, because Windows is, of course, the, the key machine that is used in a lot of business. So it is the, the machine you would want to spend time learning if you want to get a job. So if you're going to spend time learning a system, you're probably going to gravitate to Windows. Mac is accessible, but I would say it's a slightly different form of accessibility on a on a Mac, and it's not as simple as using it on the iPhone. So that does factor into a lot of people's decisions. It's what they know best, what works for them, and also what can be more beneficial long term. Now, when we're doing a shopping list, like let's say we decide, okay, we're going to go for a Windows computer, mm. is are things like RAM and video cards are they as important when you're not using the screen much? Yeah, well, you would think, especially when it comes to graphics, that that wouldn't be the case, right? Because you'd think, well, let's be honest, uh, you know, who's using the screen? But that's not the point. The software is. So if you're using a screen reader, for example, even if you have no vision at all, having a decent graphics card in there actually makes a difference. And of course, RAM or memory is really important as well, because you have to be able to support these programs. You're running more than one program at the same time. Most people, as you know yourself, will run more than one program. You might have a web browser or Microsoft yeah. Office or Outlook open at the same time or Windows Mail or whatever. All of those programs are running. You're also adding a screen reader that is trying to read that screen, grab all that information for you and turn it into audio. You're adding an awful lot of power or needing a lot of power, I guess, to pull into that system. So RAM memory is important. Don't go for anything less than 16 gigabits. And in terms of graphics cards, you know, look at those gaming PCs, look at something that's high end. Don't go for the cheaper options because you will be disappointed in performance. You won't be able to run as many programs at the same time. So lots of different companies make computers. So finding the right one is, is key. And that is looking at those high end specifications. Why don't you think Microsoft has done, um, or sorry, why don't you think that, that, that Apple has done as good of a job at incorporating those accessibility features into their desktop and laptop or operating system as they have into iOS? I think they have. I think the, the issue is the, the way that VoiceOver operates on a Mac is quite different. I mean, first of all, you need about five hands because of all the different keys you need to press at the same time to make something work. It's a challenge. They all tend to run on a similar vein, but, but VoiceOver is very much out there on its own. It is a bit more convoluted to use. The operating system is, is laid out differently, of course, on Mac versus Windows. So you have a different way of learning to, to understand how the, the whole thing works. So it's not quite as simple a layout 
to make uh, audible. And for that reason, I, I think we still struggle a little bit with voiceover. It is good, don't get me wrong. I use it, I love it. Um, but I am the kind of guy who has a Mac, but also has a Windows install on it at the same time. Would you say it's a safe assessment or a safe statement to say that Microsoft and Windows has come a long way from the days in which it used to bloat down and get you know, millions of viruses, and people just wanted to throw them under the window. I think they've come such such a long way since the days of like Windows 7 and Windows Vista. Well, of course, there was the time when we used to joke that it was called Windows because you wanted to throw it out of the nearest one. Uh, <laughs> and that's the whole thing, isn't it? That it has changed a lot. I mean, Windows 10 is possibly the best Windows that I've ever seen, for sure. A lot's changed. And I would also maybe point out the, the Microsoft range of products, the Surface Pro, uh, the, the Surface Book, uh, their own hardware is very, very good for this because, again, think about this, they've built the software in tandem yeah. with the hardware. So if you're looking for something that's good, and I, I am hearing a lot of blind people say to me that a Surface is a great machine to have. It's not the only one out there. I mean, Dell makes some amazing machines. I think the XPS line is good to look at. Um, again, those high-end graphics do matter. Uh, and, and that is really key, especially if you're a JAWS user, uh, because, you know, Rate takes a lot of uh, room up on your, your system and takes a lot of out of your system, uh, as does Magnifier graphically, because obviously it's trying to draw the screen in a much larger way for you. Um, but, you know, when it comes to those really high-end, powerful programs like JAWS, which takes a lot from your system, you need to go high end. So I'm afraid you're going to have to spend the money, Mark. If you want to do it right, you've got to spend the cash. But it's going to go much further because when you spend that cash, you're going to have it for a much longer period of time because exactly. things like solid state and things like, you know, fast memory will give you, uh, you know, great longevity. So let's see. So great amount of RAM, at least minimum 16 gigs. We're talking about a good graphics processor. What would you say storage wise, at least a terabyte of storage? Um, these days, you know what, with things like Dropbox or OneDrive, you can get away with 512 gig SSD. You know, a lot, a lot of people tend to go for the 256 gig option. That mounts up really quickly. Uh, I mean, we work in creative industries, right? So, I mean, you're working with audio and, you know, video, you know, that takes up a lot of room. For the average user, you might not notice too much. I think 512 gig minimum. Although in saying this, this is easy for me to say, Mark, because it ain't my cash. Uh, well, it will be eventually, uh, but what I'm looking at is obviously pretty high end because of what we do and what I do. But, uh, you know, most people might not need that. But I will say just one other thing, just very briefly. I mean, we talk about Mac being an option. We're obviously focusing in on Microsoft and Windows. I don't want really to forget Chromebooks either. Uh, Chromebooks are very accessible now, and maybe that's something we should pick up on in future episodes. Definitely. You know what? What better way to demonstrate what we can do on a Windows PC than to demonstrate it? So let's take a quick break. Okay. He is Stephen Scott. I am Marco Flalo. Please, again, feedback at ami.ca, at DoubleTap Canada on Twitter. Use that hashtag, AskDoubleTap. We'll take a quick break and we'll come back and let's take a dive into Windows 10 on your PC, Stephen. For more great Double Tap TV content, visit ami.ca slash double tap. This is Double Tap TV. We are back on Double Tap TV. He is Steven Scott. I am Mark Aflalo. Thank you guys for being here. If you want to get involved in the show, we invite you to do so. The email address is feedback at ami.ca. Our Twitter address is at Double Tap Canada. And use that hashtag, ask Double Tap, so that we can get to your questions, which we will later on in the show. So, Stephen, we've started talking about what to look for in a PC, specifically a Windows PC. And, and it's, it's very similar when it comes to a Mac as well. The only difference is that you're limited to, obviously, Apple hardware when it comes to a Mac right mm, yeah i mean that, that's not a bad thing in fairness and actually that's one of the great things about it because you don't have to really worry about the hardware um again though i would always say go for minimum 16 gig ram which i think is fairly standard across Macs yeah i don't now. think you can get less anymore on a mac these no days. that's good that's good i think they start with 16 yeah um and uh, so so we're talking windows and what yeah. better way to obviously dive into windows than to let everybody dive into your windows desktop and get a demonstration of, of some of these accessibility features now these are the accessibility features that are built into windows right we know we can get screen readers and third-party applications on top of that to make your lives easier but this is stuff that's built into windows right yeah so a lot of people might think out there uh, if they know anything about screen readers at all you might have heard about jaws you might have heard about nvda 
Um, the main difference being cost in those uh, cases. JAWS costs money, NVDA doesn't. I obviously prefer ones that don't. Um, there is a screen reader though built in to Windows called Narrator. And I'm actually gonna turn it on uh, right now because I use this. And uh, this is something I use to navigate the screen. And I want to show you the various settings that my computer has. Uh, so when I turn it on, a splash screen comes up telling me all about the various new functions of Narrator. Everybody gets this now. Every time there's a Windows update, there are new features added to Narrator. For those who don't really know what this is, let me just quickly explain. A screen reader is essentially turning into audio what you would see on the screen. So Mark, you've not used a screen reader before, I don't imagine. So, you know, for you, it's, you know, how does it work? How do I read the screen as a blind person? Well, it's actually really simple. The text that's on screen right now is read aloud by me just pressing the arrow keys. So as I press an arrow key. This is Narrator Home, where you can get help, access your settings, and learn about new features. Narrator is a screen reader that describes aloud what's on your screen. So there you go. So it's telling me it's reading aloud what's on the screen. And that is essentially how a screen reader operates. And I use a mixture of keys like the tab key to move around between buttons. Uh, if I want to, uh, you know, arrow down a list of maybe text, that's all I do is just use my little cursor keys. I don't use the mouse at all. Uh, you don't need to use a mouse with it, although they are developing tools that let you do that. If you still want to use the mouse, it will still read what's below the mouse cursor, which is kind of cool. But that's not the only feature that is in Windows. Of course, you've got to remember, 4% of people in the world who are blind are actually blind, if you know what I mean. So the people who class themselves as blind, including myself, I guess, we've still got some useful vision. 4% out there are actually completely blind. So that's interesting. Uh, and for that reason, there are many, many other features added into Windows to help people with low vision. So to access those, uh, it's really simple. All I do is hit the Windows key, Start window. And I type in ease of access. Type here to search. Or even just ease of. E -A -F -E space ease of. F. And then I just hit enter because what's actually popped up on the screen is the ease of access uh, part of the control panel, essentially. So I'll hit enter on that. Settings window. Make everything brighter. And I'm into the settings Current which value. give me lots of options. And it starts off with text size. Uh, it talks about the brightness of the screen as well. So I can make the text as big as I make like. Link. Change the size of apps and text on. So let me just do that. Make text bigger. So I'm going to make the text bigger. 100%. So Mark, I'm going to blow your mind here with how big I can make the text on the screen. <laughs> it's, it, it's quite incredible how uh, large this can go. Uh, so I can make the text make fairly large. Um, make text bigger. I don't think I've got it quite all the way up to the top yet. I'm just going to quickly move it along here. And uh, I don't think I'll get Bigger as far as... 50% now. 50%, okay, so we'll make it bigger than that. Come on, bigger than that. Let's go up to 70 or 80%. Well, it's them at 192%, so that's fairly reasonable that, that's size. That's pretty big. That's yeah. pretty big. But here's the great thing, Mark, right? So you use a computer all the time. Uh, you're using it visually. Wouldn't it be great just to be able to turn on some large text so you're not hurting your eyes all the time? And that's Absolutely. the key this is something point. that's definitely not only for people with low vision. Exactly. It's not, you don't have to have a disability. It's not like a code you've got to put into the software, you know, <laughs> put your disability badge number in to, in order to get access to this. It's already built into the software. Uh, so you can turn this up. This applies, of course, across all the apps. So if you were using Mail or you're using Google Chrome or Internet Explorer or Microsoft Edge, whatever browser you choose to use, all of this is available to you. Uh, on top of that, you've got high contrast options. And I'm just going to try and quickly get to that to show you how high contrast works, because I think it's a fantastic little feature. I'm going to use my cheat mode because uh, I'd like to do that. Uh, <laughs> being a blind guy, you get cheat codes in this software uh, just by using the keyboard. Uh, so I'm now in high contrast. What this will do is it will invert the colors on the screen. So if I hit the space bar on this particular button, it will actually turn the screen. And I don't know if you can see that, Mark, but it's actually changed the yeah, it's screen. Yeah, reverse the colors. Yeah. yeah, changed it from essentially, in this case, uh, white text on a black background. Again, these days, a lot of applications are using this and they call it dark mode. Of course, blind people were way ahead of the curve on this. We had high <laughs> contrast for years. Uh, so there's this, there's also the magnifier. So let's have a look at magnifier. Again, a wonderful little function. So if I go into magnifier, let me just find it here. Now what this does is this takes the screen and it zooms in. Just like that, it zooms right in to whatever I want to look at and I can easily adjust this. I can easily adjust equal sign. Equal sign. 
the depth and then use the mouse to move around the screen and you can see that I'm able to move around the screen and see much more clearly. That, that's, that's pretty impressive. Listen, you know, uh, the fact that they're baked in and they're already there for people to use is great. And now, you know, obviously finding those options is one of those tricky parts to get the first time. Well, exactly. And, you know, the interesting thing is this is all built into the system. Like you say, this is not something you have to add in. You don't have to download anything. You don't have to go and search for it. Well, you have to search for it on the system, but you don't have to go anywhere else. It's built in and you can use any of these functions at any time. It is a very powerful system that is built into every Windows computer. Again, I would strongly encourage you to try these functions out, but on a higher spec machine. Uh, the, the, the problem is, Mark, you know, you're going to try this on, on a very low end computer. You'll think, hey, I can access all this, but it's not going to look as good. If you've got low vision, especially you have issues with blur, uh, you know, magnifying in that close on a machine with poor graphics, it's just going to look pretty terrible. It's going to be really blurry and, you know, you're not going to see it as easily. But as you can tell, there are a lot of functions in there to play with. Well, you know what? We've got a couple questions lined up, so let's take a quick break. Thank you for that demonstration. It is Double Tap TV. You are Stephen Scott. I am Mark Aflalo. Again, feedback at ami.ca. Ask Double Tap is the hashtag. And of course, on Twitter, it is at Double Tap Canada. Let's take a break and we'll get to your questions. Love Double Tap TV? Listen to AMI-audio for Double Tap Canada every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern for news and reviews on everything tech. is Double Tap TV. Welcome back to Double Tap TV. Mark Aflalo and Stephen Scott with you. Feedback at AMI.ca is the email address. The Twitter address is at Double Tap Canada and the hashtag is Ask Double Tap. Stephen, uh, I've got an email from Matthew in Montreal who says, I listen to Double Tap Canada on AMI-audio all the time, and you talk about all these great features, but how on earth do you turn them on for the first time? <laughs> uh, that's a pretty good question because we did the demonstration, but when it comes to actually turning them on, I guess that's kind of important when you actually want to use them, right? Exactly. So uh, a couple of things. I mean, I kind of alluded to the main one at the beginning of the demonstration, which is using the Windows key and then typing in ease of access, and that gets you into all of the accessibility functions from high contrast to color filters to uh, narrator and magnifier and everything else that's in there. But if you want to get straight into, say, the screen reader, and you can do this in any computer shop, and I encourage you to do it because it makes the store staff go crazy. Uh, what I do is go in, hold down Control, then press Windows, hold those two keys down and tap on the Enter key, the big Enter key on the right side of the keyboard. Hit on that, that will turn on Narrator. That's it, that's all you do. I mean, it is as simple as that. You know what, I find the keyboard shortcuts in general, regardless of the application, are an incredible time saver. And I'm sure that there are keyboard shortcuts that everybody uses out there that we probably don't even think of, so half the time, that do make life a lot easier. And that's a perfect example of just enabling that by just pressing the, you know, the control, the windows, and the enter button. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of ones out there that we use every day, right? So you've got uh, control C for copy, or control V for paste, or you know, control A to select all, that kind of thing. Those are easily applicable in the screen, screen reader environment as well, and that's really important. You know, you add additional uh, things you'll learn along the way, you'll add more tools to that particular list, and a lot of them are screen reader specific, uh, but the majority of Windows commands you'll use will be the same as you've used already on your computer. So, you know, it's just a learning process that's extended, which is brilliant. Um, if you've got some vision, uh, but you would really like to be able to see the screen a bit more close up, then Magnifier could help. And for that, it is really simple. All you have to do is hold down the Windows key and press the plus or the minus key. You need to press plus first to zoom in, but you can then control the level of zoom, how far into the screen you can see by pressing the plus. Also, again, while holding down Windows first, pressing the plus and then the minus key. And then if you want to zoom all the way back out, you just hold down Windows and just keep pressing the minus key until your screen is fully available to you again. So again, really simple way of doing it. A lot of photographers use this function. Uh, I learned about this recently when a, a photographer who was fully sighted used the magnifier because he wanted to get really up close and personal with one particular image and wanted to get into the detail of it. So again, proving that point that it, yes, is an accessibility tool, 
but it's for everybody and anybody can use it. And why wouldn't you if it's available to you? So Windows and Control and Enter gets you into Narrator, the screen reader, and then you've got Windows and Plus, which will let you into Magnifier. You know, Stephen, in our last episode, we were talking about iOS 13, of course, on the iPhone. And one of your favorite features is the ability to really not even use your hands, but just talk your way through the operating system. Are there tools like that for Windows that are available out there? Or is that maybe one of those holes in the market? Or is that maybe where some of those screen readers come into play? So it's interesting with this one. There are functions within Windows that do similar, but a lot of people tend to use programs like Dragon Dictate, uh, that is a popular program for a lot of blind people especially. Uh, it has been for many years in order to write long documents. There are some people who write books that way. I know a few blind authors that do that. They prefer to use those kind of tools rather than sitting at a keyboard typing away all day. Uh, you know, you're using the keyboard all the time for your, your input to the computer. So you maybe just want to, to sit back hands off for a minute. Um, in terms of the kind of voice control equivalent on Windows, uh, I don't think we're quite there yet. Some people say we are. I'm not entirely sure. I've never seen it demonstrated in a way, not without it being particularly specialist, not built in in the way that voice control is on the uh, Mac, uh, soon to be, and also the uh, iPhone. So um, no, I, I think I think Mac has, has maybe pushed that particular a needle uh, much further. On an upcoming episode, and I, I love teasing stuff like this, you are going to see a visit that we are going to have uh, at Microsoft headquarters in Canada. Stephen, you're getting on a plane. You're flying all the way from Glasgow to Toronto. You and I are going to meet up, and we're going to meet up with Ricardo Wagner, who's the head of accessibility at Microsoft Canada. Not only is he going to talk us through their internal process and, and how they approach accessibility, which is really, really a great story in mm. itself, but we're going to get a hands-on look at some of these great products that are going going to help accessibility and are going to you know help everybody use their computers better. I, I hope you're going to document this journey of yours to Canada because I think it's going to be a super interesting one. It is. I've brought two suitcases. Uh, one of them is empty uh, and I hope it to be filled on return. Uh, we shall see. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it'll be filled with maple syrup and uh, and maple fudge. Yeah, well, I, well that's an absolute given. Uh, no, I am looking forward to this trip. I think it's going to be great, and um, it will give me a chance to to sort of really question uh, how Microsoft have made this change. Because honestly, Mark, the the narrator screen reader used to be known as the screen reader that got you to download other screen readers. Uh, that was how <laughs> bad it was. But what's changed in the last couple of years where we've seen a huge amount of investment in uh, in this kind of field and accessibility it is quite incredible. And we, we know it's partly driven by the new head of Microsoft, the, the new man at the top. Uh, and we know that that's driven by his own personal story and his relationship with disability. So uh, I, I think it's an, an interesting story I want to hear more about, and I, I, I can't wait for us to bring it here on Double Tap TV. Stephen, thank you again for another awesome episode. I look forward to speaking with you again next week. On behalf of Stephen Scott, I am Marco Flalo. We'll see you again soon. For more great Double Tap TV content, visit ami.ca slash Double Tap. Hosted by Marco Flalo and Stephen Scott. Editing and graphics, Marka Flallow and Will Attar. Production assistants, Wendy Kaufman. Integrated Describe Video Specialist, Ron Rickford. Coordinating producer, Jennifer Johnson. Director production, Karen Nye. Director programming, Brian Perdue. VP programming and production, John Melville. President and CEO, David Arrington. Copyright 2019, Accessible Media, Inc.